Welcome to this first ever webinar series by the Newton Conservators. As most of you probably know, Newton Conservators is a nonprofit established in 1961 and works to preserve and to maintain open space in Newton. For more information about the organization, check out our website at newtonconservators.org. We'd love to have you become a member while you're there. New members get a Newton Trail Guide as a welcome gift. My name is Beth Wilkinson, and I'll be the moderator of this virtual event. Barbara Bates will be providing technical assistance. With that business out of the way, let's turn to the important part of the evening. Joining Pete Gilmore for a virtual bird walk in Cold Spring Park, as so many of us have done in real life before the pandemic. Pete is a retired mathematician from Northeastern University. He has been a birder since 1951 and has been active in Newton's Christmas bird count for 15 years. As many of you probably know from the newsletter, he writes a quarterly article on Newton's birds and leads usually spring and fall bird and nature walks. Pete serves on the boards of the Newton Conservators and the Brookline Bird Club and is the field trip coordinator. Fortunately, Pete's here to share some of his vast knowledge of birds with us. Welcome, Pete. All right, let me get started here. Hello, everybody. So the first group we're gonna look at is the woodpeckers. And this is a downy woodpecker, which has a small bill. But when you walk around uh, in the park, uh, you usually hear them before you see them, or at least hearing them is a good way to see them. And this, this little tweak is a downy woodpecker. And this, that is also a downy woodpecker. So uh, those are, are birds with a small tweak and a small whinny that they make. Now notice this next woodpecker. It looks very much like a downy, but its bill is much bigger, maybe most of the way through the head if you turned it around the other way. This is a hairy woodpecker. And listen to this. Now here's a hairy woodpecker's tweak, which usually I hear before I see them. See, that's, uh, that's, that is, uh, that's a lot more frantic and sounds like a bigger bird. Uh, now here's the tweak and the whinny from the hairy. So you see it sounds bigger, but similar to a downy. So those are both in Cold Spring Park. And if you walk around slowly and the thing to do is take your time and do things at your level. There's a lot of information that goes on in birding and you just relax, enjoy nature, and enjoy what you hear and see. So a way to get these woodpeckers is to hear them. This is a red-bellied woodpecker. Uh, in my experience in Cold Spring, the males stay here and excavate um, several nest holes during the winter. You'll see them working and you think, what is that guy doing? It's January. And the females seem to float a little south of here for the winter. And in the spring, in maybe April, they come back or late March, and then the female will choose the apartment building that looks safe to raise their kids uh, among the apartment buildings that he has rented for her. This is a northern flicker which is similar. Now both the red belly and the northern flicker are bigger than the downy and the hairy. And by the way, all of these birds are permanent residents here. The, a lot of flickers go south, but there are some here all winter. Uh, and they are, have this marked crescent on the chest and they have red on the back of the head, which these pictures aren't showing. This is a male with a black mustache. This 
is a young yellow-bellied sapsucker. The sapsuckers don't nest here. They nest north of here and are now coming through going south. And this is a young one and you can imagine if you looked at the back of that bird on the tree, it would just really blend in. I have some other photographs where I'm not gonna put them up because it takes a while to even see the bird. Here's an adult yellow-bellied sapsucker. So that, on the, on the young one, you can see the red coming in there on the throat and the head, but it's not in yet. And the color has a lot of brown and mottling. And these guys are much more striking. So that's an adult male. The adult female looks the same without the red throat. This is a red-headed woodpecker, which I put in here because many people will come to you, come to me, they'll say they saw a red-headed woodpecker in Newton someplace. Uh, it's not impossible, but almost impossible. And you can see that this is almost like red, white, and blue, except it's black. Could be navy, but it really is black. And that bird has a totally red head and is really different from the red-bellied. I think people most often call this a red-headed woodpecker. That red that we see goes all the way down the back of its head and neck. So that's the woodpeckers. This is a ruby-throated hummingbird. Most of them have gone south, but there's still a few around. This is a little, probably adolescent male. I think he's starting to get dark color in on his throat. A female would have a white throat. Uh, and they are mostly gone, but you can see them still. And uh, here is their setup for breeding and migration. The, the pink is where they breed, the yellow is their migration, and the blue is spending the winter. You can see there's a little blue at the tip of Florida. And these hummingbirds, you're familiar with them, they're really little, they're two tenths of an ounce. A lot of them choose to migrate down that yellow path through Mexico to Central America. But a fair number of them come down where we live to the Gulf Coast and fly a thousand miles across the Gulf of Mexico, which for a bird that is two tenths of an ounce is an enormous journey. And uh, you know, if they run into a thunderstorm or a hurricane, Probably they wouldn't take off, they would sense a hurricane coming, but if they get in a squall, it doesn't have to be that big, uh, they're dead. And, and they use up, they tank up on nectar and carbs and sugar and fatten up before they fly and then they lose all of that and probably burn through some muscle weight uh, to get where they're going. This is a bird who, uh, jokingly is described as having the best field marks for this bird are no field marks. It's a warbling vireo and they are migrating out of here but they do nest in Cold Spring Park. They're over by Beaconwood Road for one place. They like to be around water uh, and they have a lot of warbling sounds. Uh, I'm not gonna keep playing everybody's sounds because we don't have enough time. But they're here uh, still. And warbling vireos, here is the breeding, migrating, and wintering uh, behavior. And they're not going over the water, they're going down through Mexico. So it's dangerous enough, but not like the hummingbirds. This is still around, red-eyed vireos. They nest here. In fact, in the last few days, I've heard them still singing. They have incessant songs. Uh, I think they're sort of almost like snow crickets where you can tell what the temperature is for how often they're singing. Uh, and here's their, you see they're all across the Eastern and Canada and the United States, and then they go down through Central America to Brazil. Some of them you can see probably hop across to Cuba, 
and Haiti and down the Antilles to get to South America. That's a red-eyed vireo, another one. Here's a blue-headed vireo, which looks pretty much the same in the fall as it does in the spring. It has that gray-blue head and spectacles. It has a white eye ring, but also has a little white going up to the base of the bill like it was eyeglasses and a little yellow under the wing. Here's, so here's another bird that stays with us all winter, the black-capped chickadee, which has this white in the wings as well as the face, the black and white face. But the wings with the white uh, feathers uh, separates it from the Carolina chickadee. If you have relatives in Maryland or Virginia and you drive, I guess we're not traveling a lot, but some people may drive south, you'll get a chickadee that looks just like this, but with almost no white in the wings. And that's a Carolina chickadee. And due to global warming, this bird, the black-capped chickadee, which is the Massachusetts state bird, may be hard to see in Massachusetts. They may only be in the Berkshires and north of here, and they may get replaced by the Carolina chickadee. Uh, that's in the Audubon studies. This is the tufted titmouse, which is a little gray cardinal, which is related to the chickadee, which again is resident here, spends the winter and, and flies around in little loose flocks in the winter, they'll be found with chickadees and downy woodpeckers and white-breasted nuthatches, which is what this is. And the white-breasted nuthatch has kind of a yank, 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 yank song. Uh, and you may hear that before you see them. Uh, the little chickadees you will hear, but you often see them. They're not afraid of people very much. This is a red-breasted nuthatch, which is a relative of the white breast. Now the white-breasted nuthatch are around here, year-round and common and nest. These guys nest north of here, <clears throat> but this year seems to be an eruption year, and that meaning that they come in big numbers south, probably because of food. And they've been around. We've seen them in Cold Spring Park the last few days and they're all around Massachusetts and probably south of here by now. Uh, this is a brown creeper. Now these babies are hard to see, as you can imagine. Uh, and they're in Cold Spring Park and they uh, nest and are permanent here, but they, uh, they fly down to the base of a tree and they go, around the tree looking under the bark for insects, but always spiraling up the tree, whereas nuthatches, which have a similar behavior, spiral down the tree, and the two birds aren't really in competition. They see different insects because of the direction of their uh, search. Uh, this is a brown creeper. This is a ruby-crowned kinglet, and you almost never see that ruby crown. Uh, it's hidden unless they get excited. So this photo is from the spring, uh, but here is the way we're gonna see them in the fall. So that's much more characteristic. Now, this little guy has a ruby crown buried under the gray feathers on his crown, but that eye and the wing bars, uh, and he's very little much smaller than a sparrow uh, and furtive jumping around. Well, incredibly active. They flick their wings all the time. So if you see a little bird that's constantly flicking its wings, try and get your binoculars on it. And uh, this is one of the two birds it would be. The other one is this, which is a golden crown kinglet related and has a different look. Uh, the picture doesn't, it does show it a little. You can, it has a pretty bold white line over the top of the eye, as well as having this golden crown. 
the female would not have that, that red in the middle of the golden crown. It would just be all gold. Here's a Carolina wren. It's the largest of our wrens, uh, kind of rusty brown with that white eye stripe, and it stays around all winter and sings all winter long. And it's, it's just great to hear this in January or February. And uh, they're just really spunky and they hang out around human habitation. See how they pick out a theme and repeat it, repeat it, repeat it? It's a Carolina wren. There are some around my house that make that dialect and it sounds to me a little bit like chirpity, 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 chirpity. But uh, I have a bird watcher friend whose daughter came in the house and said, a bird was looking right at me screaming, meat eater, meat eater, meat eater. And that's a Carolina wren. So there's a lot of dialects. Here's a winter wren. This is the smallest of our wrens, like a little mouse. Usually you see them low in the undergrowth and they're kind of hard to see. Look at the perky tail and dark underneath. Um, uh, but the way you get usually in contact with them is you hear this fantastic song, which is like water bubbling over boulders in a brook. It's just irrepressible, beautiful little song. And if you hear that, then you try to tease out the winter wren with clucking or pishing noises whatever your favorite little, little uh, bird annoyance is. And they're in, uh, they're in the big swampy area on the, really the west side of uh, Cold Spring Park. This is a house wren, which uh, probably some of you have nesting in your backyards, has a irrepressible song, not as, much like a bubbling brook as the winter wren, but really, and he has that little tail sticking up and uh, is a bigger wren than the winter wren. This is a blue gray gnat catcher who you don't usually see like that, but <coughs> they're around and they're migrating south. They nest here, they nest in Cold Spring. And I was playing a tape to stir birds up. I have a tape which has chickadees mobbing a screech owl and this gnat catcher got really angry at the tape I was playing. I was with another birder and he had a baseball hat on and this bird landed on his hat <laughs> looking around for where the screech owl was to get mad at it and then went back to the tree and I caught it jumping like this. This is a black-billed cuckoo. And some years they nest in Cold Spring Park. They fly south, but you can see cuckoos in the fall in migration. And so, uh, but they're very furtive. So that's a hard bird to come across. Here's a cedar waxwing. This picture I took in Newton Cemetery in the winter, and they are just so svelte. Well, they're just gorgeous birds. Uh, and they're around all winter, but they're sort of chancy. They're nomadic. They're around all winter, but in the winter they're in flocks and they're looking for like these fruits he's eating. And they'll gather this year, that year that I took the picture, there was a lot of this crab apple leaf fruit in the back of Newton Cemetery and it was a big flock of these guys there. Now see this looks the same but this has rusty undertail coverts and a little different look on the face. That's a bohemian waxwing which is northern taiga Canada breeder which in eruptive years comes here so we should look for it keep an eye out Here's the look of the cedar wax wing, and you see that's white under the tail there. And the belly, in fact, is kind of a yellowish. And this guy is gray and russet under the tail. This is another bohemian wax wing. See the russet under the tail. And notice the wings, when you see the bird from the side, you get white 
in the wings where the uh, cedar wax wings have different colors. They, you can see red tips, wax wing. They have uh, yellow wax on the tail and red wax on the wing feathers. So those are the two wax wings. And you see the yellow a little bit better in this picture. This is a cat bird who nests in Cold Spring Park and are with us all summer and do this <coughs> like a cat noise. Uh, they also make a noise that I call electrostatic, kind of a really sounds like a electrostatic noise in the, in the air. Uh, and they are going to be getting out of here pretty soon, but they're still around. You can see them in the fall. Here's a mockingbird, and mockingbirds are having a tough time. There used to be more of them here, but they're still around, and if they are around, they'll spend the winter in more or less the same area. Here's a great horned owl. Uh, I was uh, birding a few days ago with a very good young birder who is a senior at Newton North, Max Chalfin Jacobs, and he and I saw three kinds of owls, or were in touch with three kinds of owls. We certainly saw great horned owls, which this is one. Uh, this is a barred owl. There was a barred owl on that day in Cold Spring Park down low. Uh, this guy was, when I took this picture, was a little above my head on a white pine, but this, uh, barred owl the last few days has been low. It's been behind the dugout around the brook behind the dugout in the baseball field that's right next to the off-leash dog area. So that's a place to look for a barred owl right now. Also resident here. Now the, all these owls are resident here all year round. This is a gray phase screech owl in Cold Spring Park. Um, and this guy had this, it was just this opening in the tree and he roosted there. Uh, here's a red phase screech owl. So those are the same species, but some of them genetically come up gray and some of them come up red, uh, but they're all screech owls. Here's a morning dove, which most people are familiar with. The long pointy tail, if they're on the phone wires or around, the long pointy tail is a giveaway and the look and the dove face. And also if you're near them when they fly, they communicate uh, danger by their wings, which make a noise when they fly, kind of a whistling noise. Here's a great blue heron. They're in and out of mostly the wet areas over on the east side near uh, Beaconwood Road. Uh, there's a pretty wet marsh over there and then uh, south of there there's a wet place. This is a green heron. They uh, don't spend a lot of time in Cold Spring Park but they do come in and out. Uh, I often see them over by Beaconwood Road in that marshy area over there. Canada Goose. Everybody pretty much knows them. Uh, and they, you might see them flying over. You might see them grazing, eating grass somewhere around. Mallards, people are pretty familiar with. This is the male. Uh, and they're in Cold Spring. Here's a female with some ducklings. The ducklings by now would be much bigger than that. Maybe they would be big enough to not be with the female. But look at this female, her feathering is pretty light down the front and on the neck and all. But, and the reason I'm pointing that out is there's another duck that you may see, which is this, which is a black duck. And the mallards are genetically pretty close to black ducks and mallards have been introduced more here and they're outbreeding. There's a lot of hybrid male black duck ducks and the black duck pure strain is getting to be in danger because of all the mallard interbreeding. This is another black duck and you can see this light on the neck but then very dark below and kind of a what is that a yellow greeny bill. 
Here's a wood duck. They nest in Cold Spring Park uh, and are still here. This is a male, which is big, showy, gorgeous. Here's the female, and she has her own form of beauty, that blue in the wing and the white. I, I find her pretty beautiful. Uh, this is a wood duck in eclipse plumage, a juvenile. It's a male, but he hasn't gotten there yet. Here's a blue jay, which we're all pretty familiar with and the noises they make, and they're intelligent and saucy and characters. Robins. Uh, now the robins that nest here go south, you know, maybe to the Carolinas or Georgia. And we get lots of robins in here in the winter and they are from Canada and uh, Maine and New Hampshire. And there's, if you go down to the fens in the evening as it's getting dark behind the Museum of Fine Arts in the Phragmites that grow along the muddy river there, there are thousands of robins that fly in from the surrounding suburbs and roost in there together. And then in the morning they come out and spread out and Cold Spring Park has a lot of berries in it. Some of them good native plants and some of them invasive species that the robins love the berries and poop the seeds around and help spread the invasives. But there's a lot of robins in Cold Spring Park, which surprises people a little, but it's because of humans here. The, the temperature in the city of Boston is just warm enough that they can roost safely in those Phragmites behind the museum and uh, make it through the winter and then come out here and eat berries. It, they're not eating worms because the ground is frozen. This is a bluebird which I put in here because people will often mistake blue jays for bluebirds, but you can see this is a very different, beautiful little thrush related to the robin. And I've seen them in Cold Spring Park, but I just put it in here like I put the red-headed woodpecker. Uh, so people don't call something a bluebird when it isn't uh, for their own sanity. Um, here's a turkey vulture, see the red turkey-like head, and you see them soaring like this overhead. And they soar very characteristically with their wings in a slight V, which you don't see a lot of in this picture, but you can see some of it. This is a red-tailed hawk. It has a white chest and all that brown speckling below the white, and the brown speckling goes all the way across, and that's a telltale way to tell red-tailed hawks. See the same chest and speckling on this bird white, and you also see on the tail of this bird kind of fine barring. Uh, it's not red, this is a first year bird, which we see a lot of here. <clears throat> but there's an enormous variation in uh, plumage. This black right here is uh, called a patagial mark right there. And all red tails have that. You get a lot of white, you get different bl black and brown and you know, you always get this and you always, this brown and you always get this white, but some of them will be dark here. And then the adults will have completely red tail. And, but all of them, adults, young, everybody has this patagial black mark. This is another red tail soaring overhead. Uh, and you, you know, if you look close, you can see the patagial black, but you can see that this, this guy looks pretty dark on the throat. Uh, and this is what birding comes to be, that try and recognize the marks when it's not perfect visibility. This is a sharp-shinned hawk, which uh, is pretty easily confused with the larger Cooper's hawk. A rule of thumb is that the sharpies are the size of a blue jay, 
and the coops are the size of a crow. On the other hand, in both species, the females are larger so that a big female Sharpie can be almost the same size as a small male coop. Uh, if you look at the breast on this bird, the streaks are kind of fat, you know, broad brush streaks. And now when we go to the coop, you'll see that the streaks are skinnier. The Sharpie also, this guy's been molting, but they have sharp corners on the tail, which is, I don't know, they sharp shinned, but they have sharp corners on the tail. This is a Cooper's hawk, and they're around here all winter, and uh, they eat um, songbirds. And you can see that that's kind of a, not such a huge long wing. The wing, main wing there is somewhat stubby and these guys are very versatile at flying right through trees and brush. They have incredible reflexes. Uh, there's a sled chase in Star Wars, maybe the second movie, a sled chase through trees and brush that reminds me of the reflexes that these guys have to operate the way they do. But I also want to bring to everybody's attention that it's part of nature that if you have bird feeders in Newton in the winter and you get nice birds coming, you are going to get a coop, a cooper's hawk, and you're going to be on like dogs go around and have an area they mark with pee. A cooper's hawk will have feeders where it goes from one to another trying to opportunistically surprise songbirds. And they're, you know, I have feeders all winter and I find feathers, I think, whoop, well, another tufted titmouse bit the dust here. And uh, it's nature. This one is a, uh, an immature because of the brown streaking on the breast. This is a coop. Uh, this, this is mature. You can see that it's kind of reddish across the breast and, and the, in the, the armpit there. And it has, a, both of them have a very broad banding on the tail. You can see it there, very broad bands, much bolder than the banding on the red-tailed hawk. These Cooper's hawks, the females are bigger than the males and they get pretty big. Uh, they're the size of crows, more or less. So sometimes people will, uh, a small male red-tailed hawk might resemble this, but, uh, you know, the tail markings are different. There are differences. That's the coops. This is a grackle, and they're migrating south now. Today I drove through a flock of maybe a, a thousand grackles. Uh, and they're going to go south and people in Kentucky are going to hate them because they're going to get into the corn and the grains down there. This is a rusty blackbird and you see it has a white eye and it looks like a grackle, but a grackle has a yellow eye. This guy has a white eye and this guy is a rare blackbird who nests north of us and mo for the most part winters south of us. But uh, we see them in Cold Spring Park in the big wet marshy area and sometimes over by Beaconwood Road where it's wet. They like wet woods. That's another uh, rusty blackbird. Okay, now we're going to clip through some warblers. This is a fall plumage yellow rumped warbler, a butterbutt, and you can see that yellow rump on the warbler. Now, notice there's also some yellow by the shoulder right in front of the wing and kind of a plain face and pretty much white underneath, a little streaky around under the wings. And this is what I mean now about do things how you feel comfortable. Because starting to tell warblers apart, there's a lot of them, they're little, they're moving around in the leaves and to uptake the information and on the spot use it just takes time. So you don't judge yourself and you don't push it. You listen and you look. 
This is a prairie warbler, much less beautiful, well, I don't know, a different kind of beauty than they are in the spring. But you see that's pretty different from the yellow rump. Yellow rump has a lot going on with brown and this guy is all yellow on the stomach with some streaking on the sides and that eye. This is a magnolia warbler, which is much duller than it looks in the spring. If you look at the breast, the yellow breast, first of all, the yellow catches your eye, but then you have to notice that the streaks form a pretty complete necklace. They're blurry now, they're much stronger in the spring. But, and, and this bird, the telltale mark is the tail. You see the white in the second picture there's no other warbler, see all the yellow there, but in, if you happen to see it from this angle, you don't see the breast at all. But if the wing were down, it would appear to have a yellow rump there. Well, it does, but the main thing is that those white windows in the tail are really diagnostic for Mag Maggie. Okay, now this is, uh, this is a Cape May warbler and, uh, I want to just point something out. What makes it a Cape May warbler is this gray patch on the cheek right there. That, uh, that's very characteristic with the yellowish stuff over the eye and the throat. But you know, you, you have to be able to see the face of a little bird that's moving fast. Uh, and the Cape Mays nest north of here. We see them in migration, they don't nest here. And uh, they have a pretty small area of wintering. You know, uh, the Bermuda, the Bahamas, Cuba, a little along the Yucatan coast. Haiti, Dominican Republic, and, and so climate change could cause them problems to exist. This, you see, you got the same gray cheek patch on this guy, but this shows you how different birds can be. This is a uh, much more colorful Cape May warbler, the same bird that I circled the cheek patch on before who was very dull. So, you can see about the information. Now here is somebody with very little telltale marks. Although you can see it's a, a fall warbler and it has pink legs, which you, you know, you have to be aware and look for. It also has stripes on the back. Uh, so that makes it a black pall warbler. It has a black head in the spring, which is why it's called black pall. But in the fall, they've molted into a much duller plumage now. They're not mating, not trying to attract females. And, uh, but the, the pink legs on a warbler makes it black pall at this time of year. This is another black pole, and you can't really see the legs on this, but I'm putting it here because you see the yellowish wash in the face, which they have, and there's no gray cheek on this bird. It's not a, a Cape May. Here's another one, and you can see the pink leg on that one some. And now, like the ruby throats, the hummingbirds that went a thousand miles across the Gulf of Mexico, Black ball warblers are five and a half inches and they're half an ounce. So they are bigger than hummingbirds, but they're not big. They're really little, like half of a sparrow. A lot of them take off from Newfoundland and they fly nonstop to Venezuela. People see them going over Bermuda in the middle of the night and they don't come down. They've learned that they can fly out in the Atlantic, bring hurricanes to us, come across from Africa, and more or less direct at Northern South America and the Caribbean. 
So they fly out on the Atlantic and then those winds carry them in to South America, which saves energy, but they burn up every bit of carbohydrate and fat that they can store up. A lot of them, as the map shows, do uh, come down the coast of the United States and exit through Florida and Cuba and Haiti and down the Antilles, which doesn't take such, but a lot of them take off from Massachusetts or the Carolinas and fly over the ocean the same way. It's astounding uh, the feats they accomplish every year. This is a black pole. You can see the pink legs on that one. This is a little common yellow throat male uh, on a sumac fruit. And uh, they're, they're breed here, and they're, <coughs> they're gonna leave us. All these warblers eat insects. We actually have some yellow rump warblers that spend the winter and they switch over from insects to berries. To my horror one time, I saw a yellow rump warbler wolfing down poison ivy berries, but it was good nourishment for him. It just wouldn't have been good for me. Anyway, the common yellow throats are here still. Maybe the ones that are here are coming from the north and going south, <coughs> and ours have already gone south, perhaps. Here they move south. You can see that they breed here and then they, they don't go so far in the winter. This is a female common yellow throat. She doesn't have a loon ranger mask, but she's got a great yellow throat and she's little. This is an American red start being, they've, they've been seen the last few days. I saw them in Cold Spring Park. This is a, a good uh, male with the red and black. The first year males and the females have yellow <coughs> where this guy has red. So we call them yellow starts. This is a black-throated blue warbler. So we've been doing warblers for quite a while now. And we've seen them the last few days in Cold Spring Park. So they are around. And for the black-throated blues, you can see that strip of pink that goes down the Appalachians. So they don't breed right around where we are, but they breed out in the Berkshires. And then they go south for the winter, as you see where the blue is. This is a Connecticut warbler, which, uh, strangely enough, we never see in Massachusetts in the spring, they migrate up the middle of the country more and nest north of here. But in the fall, we do see some of them. <coughs> and it was last Sunday that Max Chalfin Jacob saw one of these in Cold Spring Park in the wet area. So it may still be around and it's not out of the question, but that's a very hard bird to see in Cold Spring Park. This is a very sulky, creature. And here's the Connecticut warblers. You see they breed mostly in Canada. <coughs> and this map shows that they never come here, that they migrate north and south through the middle of the country and then go down to Brazil and, and, and Argentina. But that's not quite right. Here's a goldfinch, which if you have thistle feeders, you will get in the winter. In fact, you'll get a faithful flock if you have a thistle feeder who will come and the males will lose this yellow, pretty yellow, and they will then resemble the females. You can see this is a duller bird. Uh, still has the black wings, but they're more olivey than bright yellow. Here's uh, an American cardinal, northern cardinal, and that bird with it is a purple finch, which you see has this beautiful raspberry head, chest, and the raspberry kind of goes down the back and on the top of the rump there. And we have a lot of house finches that are not this colorful. Uh, one way to tell them is the amount of red on the back, but that's a judgment call. 
maybe a little better is you see under the wing of this bird, it's pink with basically no brown marks. And a house finch is going to have brown marks under the wing on the belly. Here's a song sparrow that's around here all year round. Uh, has a long tail, pretty hefty beak, uh, and the tail is rounded on the end. You don't see that so well here, but it is. And all this streaking, and then in the middle of the breast is a brown blotch, which we can't see here, but this is pretty heavily streaked bird. And I'm saying that because Okay, this is a swamp sparrow with much less streaking on the breast, and it has a white throat and reddish in the wings. And they're around right now, they're in Cold Spring Park, both of the sparrows, the song and the swamp. But here is one of the real reasons I was talking all that way about the song sparrow. This guy has a smaller, pointier, delicate beak. He has a yellowish stripe over his eye, and he has pretty delicate markings on the breast. But he has this, he's got a lot of the same marks as a song sparrow, but the beak is a more delicate tool, and the line over the eye <coughs> is yellowish. This is the same savanna sparrow. So here you see the blotch in the middle of the breast, perhaps, and uh, the yellow over the eye and the reasonably small beak. This is a Lincoln sparrow, and this is a more even more delicate. You can see the the breast and the stomach has very delicate brown streaking, but a huge gray over the eye and a delicate beak and these uh, Lincoln sparrows, we only see them in migration. So they nest north of here, migrate through here, and they're migrating through right now. We see them now and uh, go to mostly Mexico. This is a couple of chipping sparrows. The one on the left is an adult with a chestnut crown, and the other one is getting it, but still has kind of a messy crown, so it's a first year bird beginning to get adult plumage. This is a good adult chipping sparrow here with the white. Here you don't see the white so well, it's, that's the photography. This has the white. This is a field sparrow, which has this cute little pink beak and completely gray, no streakings at all on the breast <coughs> and a chestnut crown. These birds are north of here, although they, they uh, nest in the Berkshires, except with global warming, people are keeping count <coughs> of how many white-throated sparrows they see, and they're seeing fewer and fewer during the summer nesting in the Berkshires, so they're getting pushed north. But they'll be under your feeders uh, this winter if you have bird feeders, and they have this great yellow and black and white on the head and the, and the white throat that they're named for. Uh, this is a white crowned sparrow, which looks like the white throat, but has this fantastic look on it. Uh, seems to have not much of a neck. The head joins the torso, pink beak. That's a, a first year bird, all brown. This is an adult white crowned sparrow, which is, so, is similar to the white throated, but different. Uh, here's a male house sparrow who has uh, a lot of black on his face. You can just see some black around his eye and a gray cheek and a gray back of his head, gray nape. Here's a female house sparrow. She doesn't look a whole lot like the male. Has a very plain face and no streaks underneath like the song sparrows and the other guys up above. And uh, the house sparrows along with starlings are actually experiencing a population decline 
at least as much as some of our songbirds and uh, should make us all think because it's not because of habitat destruction because they all love to live around humans. So they're ingesting something and we're probably ingesting the same thing and it's causing them to decline. And this is a red cross bill, which uh, is a nest north, well, actually Darwin was fascinated with these birds. Uh, they, uh, you see how that you got to look closely, but you can see that the mand the beaks, the mandible upper and lower mandible, like really a deformed beak, <coughs> and that beak is a specialized beak that allows them to extract the nuts from pine cones, pine nuts, uh, very efficiently. And there's uh, ten or twelve subspecies of red crossbills in North America, and uh, they're very opportunistically. This year, there was a group of them that nested in Montague out in north central Massachusetts, but they are being seen around here now. It seems to be an eruptive year. Most of these birds are north of us up in Canada, and when a certain kind of cone crop fails in Canada, they move south looking for cones. And the different subspecies specialize in different cones. And um, so that Darwin was pretty fascinated with this bird because if you get, for instance, global warming or some insect scourge as a result of global warming that wipes out a certain kind of spruce tree or pine tree, these birds are ready to adapt because they have 10 somewhat different beaks that are efficient at certain cones and that population pressure of no trees of a certain type will drive them to develop more and more another kind of beak like there's a whole book on the Galapagos beak related to evolution uh, called the beak of the finch which is 20 years old, but it's a good read about evolution and birds. Uh, so that's it. Uh, thank you. And uh, I think we can do questions. Yes, we can. Thank you, Pete, very much. Thank you for an informative and really fun walk in Cold Spring through Cold Spring Park. Let's get to some questions now. Thank you. Uh, Pete, question one, why Cold Spring Park? What drew you to Cold Spring in the beginning and why does that continue to be your main stomping grounds? I live near Cold Spring. Nahantan Park might be, uh, you can argue. I mean, it's a, Nahantan Park is a very good place to look at birds in Newton in addition to Cold Spring. It's just a little bit farther for me to get to. So, and also uh, my wife and I walk our dog every morning and we always walk near Cold Spring. Uh, the current dog likes to look for food in the street, but the dog we had before loved the woods and she would take us into Cold Spring. So it's an easy walk and the dogs take us there. That's and I, I like to bird. I love nature and walking in the woods. And there's much more in Cold Spring than birds. And you have so much habit different types of habitat there too. So it seems to me that should let you see a lot more of them. That's right. Well, Alan, who's the, the director, the chair of the Friends of Cold Spring Park has a question for you. He wanted to know, whether all the photos were taken there. Now you told us one of them was taken in the cemetery, but what about the other photos? Are they all, are they all from Cold Spring Park? Uh, you know, maybe 50% are Cold Spring. Uh, I'd say all of those are in Massachusetts. Um, 
maybe 50% in Cold Spring, but it, it's just happenstance that you happen to get a photograph that is halfway decent of a particular bird. So I run around Massachusetts a lot birding. And so I take pictures in different places. That's neat. Well, one of our attendees tonight wants to know what camera you use to get such great photos. Uh, I have a Nikon Mark IV and uh, I have a 100-400 zoom. Uh, so uh, it's a fairly common birding camera. The, the, the young people are much better than people my age at documenting everything they see. And so a lot of them have more or less this camera, maybe a newer version, but, uh, and they are quick at shooting and I tend to want to look and sometimes don't get a shot because I'm looking. Well, I'm glad you got all of those to share with us because they're amazing. We have some more questions. Uh, we have a question about Coopers. Uh, are they getting rarer in Cold Spring Park? He wants to know now that we are getting more and more Norway maples rather than white pines. Wait a minute. Is that... Well, are the Coopers hawks getting... Are, you, are there fewer of them in the park? No, no. So the Coopers hawks... We used to have a mixture of Coopers and sharp shinned. And there's basically no more sharp shin in the winter. We get some in migration, but the Coopers, uh, Coopers are doing very well around humanity these days. <laughs> the, the Audubon Society believes that the, the huge demise of kestrels, sparrow hawks, is due to Coopers hawks. Uh, which are a bigger hawk and seem to knock off kestrels. So the Cooper's hawks are, you don't see them as much as you see red tails. The big hawks that people see are red tails, but the Cooper's and the Cooper's, uh, they nest uh, one block west, more or less, one to two blocks west of Cold Spring Park along the aqueduct where there are these big white pines. Mm -hmm. They nest there every year. They nested there this year. And so then you see them all around. Neat. They certainly are a ton of them in my little section of Newton Center. Uh, we have another question about what birds can be seen. What about snowy owls? We have a question from Bob. Well, they, they certainly can be seen in Massachusetts. Uh, they live on the tundra and they like places that look like that. So they're often on the beaches and at airports. They're always at Logan Airport. Um, and if you can get a vantage point uh, in South Boston or Winthrop where you can look across or, or God forbid you took a plane, you can <laughs> look for them as you take off or land. But looking from South Boston or Winthrop, over at the runways, you sometimes can see them. In fact, they're so regular at Logan that there's a guy named Norm Smith at uh, the Blue Hills uh, place, Audubon place, and he has contracted so that they don't kill them at the airport because they're a danger to planes. If they go into a jet intake, a snowy owl would not leave the plane unscathed. Uh, so the, he contracts with the airport and he goes out there and traps snowy owls and he traps 20 a winter probably. And in the fall when they're coming south, he takes them to Duxbury Beach and turns them loose. And in the spring when they're going north, he takes them up to places like Plum Island and turns them loose. Uh, and he's actually got a website where he has, uh, they've put trackers on them and tracked snowy owls. So I don't have at the tip of my tongue the name of the website, but if you 
look Google around enough, you can find this and it's pretty interesting. They have the whole year of a snowy owl. Wow. We'll find it and we'll send it out with the note that we usually but not, send out. I, you know, yeah, okay. Uh, I mean, but Cold Spring Park is the wrong habitat for a snowy. Uh, so all of these amazing birds that you know and that you listen to by ear, uh, clearly a lot of us aren't as experienced. How do you suggest that we get to learn the calls? Or well, to associate the calls with the correct birds. Yeah. Uh, so um, it's hard to do. Uh, there are apps. Uh, there are now apps which I don't think are so great yet, which allow you to record the bird and then it tries, the app tries to identify it. But there's often a lot of surrounding noise obscuring it. The, the bird apps like the Sibley Guide to the Birds and iBird Pro and Audubon, uh, they all have the bird sounds, but you probably want to get in the woods with somebody who knows some of them. Uh, you pretty much have to do that, uh, you know, because hearing a bird and then starting to search through all the different songs on an app is just not anything, even the most patient human being doesn't want to do that. Cornell Lab of Ornithology also has a course you can take. Now that takes a lot of sort of out of the woods time. Yeah, that's right. But yeah, there's, there's bunches of people and, and I got to say that the of course, bird watchers include all kinds of personalities, but I'd say 95% of people who bird love to share it. And so if you know anybody who knows some bird sounds, you can walk with them and, and begin learning. That's the best way, without yeah. a doubt. And, and you can also, on your own, try to hear a sound and see who's making it, but that's tough, yeah. That's doing a lot all at the same time. Yeah. I know from one of your favorite times of year is the Christmas bird count, and we have two questions about the Christmas bird count. Uh, do you think it's going to be taking place this year? What, do you have any idea what's going on and how, what usually happens during it? Well, we're gonna have to, uh, everybody's gonna to have to wear a mask and social distance. And I think we're gonna to have to have small groups. Um, I usually go with four or five people in a car at five in the morning uh, and go for owls. I would, I would it, it hasn't been set up yet, but I think probably we're gonna do owling differently and we're gonna have a little caravan of people who are interested. And what we'll do is we'll go to a spot that we, where we know historically we've heard this owl and we'll all get out of the car, our different cars, not singular. And um, then I have a boom box, uh, an old style boom box. And I play, for instance, a screech owl uh, song, a mating, territorial call. And if you do that in late December, the owls, the screech owls, the barred owls, the great horned owls, they're all starting to court. And by February, the female owls are on eggs, sometimes with snow on their backs. So late December, if you go around like that, so that will still work, I think, because if there are people who haven't seen owls much, they love it. And there's always a few people like that. They'll just have to be in a separate car in the caravan. And then we all get out in the parking lot of Newton South High School and we play screech owl tapes. <laughs> and several of us have pretty powerful floodlights. And somebody 
sees a screech owl come in in the dark uh, and the snow and the cold and we get spotlights on it and sometimes people get pictures of those uh, but you see them and generally we see screech owls and great horned owls at the Christmas bird count. Then we go back to uh, uh, Leanne Hartnett's house on Rayburn Terrace in the Highlands, and we have uh, bagels and donuts and coffee, and organize ourselves into groups, which this year are gonna have to be small and pretty carefully done. And I usually lead people into some places around the center of Newton involving Cold Spring Park for one place. And there are places where I won't take a group of people this year because it's a narrow trail. Everybody has to either be in the front and see the bird or forget it. And uh, so I'll only take people to pretty wide open places. And now all of this that I'm saying is speculation on my part. There's no given here, but right. we'll get the word out. Leanne Hartnett and I will get the word out about what is going to happen. And if it's not going to happen, we'll get that word out. Terrific. And as always, the conservators will help you get it out. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. We have a couple more specific questions. I think we have time for a couple more here. Uh, we have a question about goshawks. I think I see them. Am I confusing them with something else, perhaps? Probably Cooper's hawks. Although, Lord, maybe 25 years ago, a uh, first-year goshawk caught a squirrel under my feeders. And um, because he was a young bird, he figured, wow, look at all these squirrels. I'm going to hang around here. And he was around my backyard for three days or so, which is astounding. You don't see goshawks here ever much, although here was this one. And, but the squirrels are all wise to him, <laughs> which an adult goshawk would have killed, eaten, and flown on because they know they have to surprise yeah. Yeah. their prey. This young bird didn't realize that squirrels, uh, it was amazing. I would watch a squirrel on a tree and the goshawk on the side of a tree and the goshawk would line it up and then he would come like a bullet through the air and the squirrel would wait until he was pretty close. And then the squirrel would scurry one quarter of a way around the tree. <laughs> the goshawk would shoot past the tree. At one point there was a squirrel out on the snow and there was maybe eight inches of snow and I had snow blown my driveway. And the squirrel was being chased. The goshawk, again, lowered, here it comes like an arrow right at the squirrel and the squirrel saw it coming and the squirrel was running across the open, right out in the open towards my driveway. Yeah. And it was such, tension to watch and the squirrel went right over the lip of the snow where and and crouched down just under the lip at the edge of the driveway and the goshawk shot over the top and the squirrel bolted for a tree <laughs> so it was exciting stuff but you don't where somebody's talking plural goshawks if if you were uh somewhere up on the north shore they do nest uh up near Georgetown and some of the towns up there. Okay. But they're not in Newton. They're very rare in Newton. So if you're seeing a lot of them, you're probably seeing Cooper's Hawks. Well, this same person clearly has an ulterior motive to want to see them in a little wishful thinking because she says, we have a lot of rabbits in our yard in the Highlands. Could we attract an owl to our neighborhood to help control them? Maybe a red tail. Uh, well, coyotes too. And in the highlands, you should get red tails and coyotes both. Uh, they're not doing their job if she's got too many rabbits. <laughs> I've got a rabbit just destroying uh, plants in my yard. And I really want somebody, well, my wife and I disagree on this. She doesn't want carnage. 
<laughs> well, we have time for a final question, and that is, when did you get into burning? birding? What's your story? Uh, my mother was a birder, and I got started in about seventh grade, I lived in Maryland, and uh, uh, chickadees and uh, golden wing warblers I found just beautiful and interesting to watch, interesting behavior. And there was another kid around the same age, and the two of us birded a lot. And, and it, the love of it never left me. And, you know, when I was working and raising kids, it went into kind of a comatose state, but it was there. And now it's back. Much to the advantage of all of us. Thank you so much. It, this was just absolutely amazing. And we really appreciate you all being here. Thanks so much, Pete. Bye-bye, everyone.